But thank you for uh, joining us today for the wrap up session of the program for open scholarship and education, aka POSE. Um, and thank you for joining and participating for the last four months, as well as this morning. Uh, we know the end of April is really can be a busy time. And we appreciate you taking time to, to conclude the program with us. Um, just as a refresher, my name is Will Engel, and I'm a strategist for open education um, with the UBC's Center for Teaching, Learning and Technologies. Um, POSE is really a group effort, and I'm joined today by some really fantastic people who helped develop, organize, and facilitate the program, and I'm just going to have them introduce themselves. Um, so I'll turn it over to Erin. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to see you all here. My name is Erin Fields, and I am the Open Education and Scholarly Communications Librarian at uh, UBC Vancouver. I um, have had the most uh, engagement inside of the open access and open research sections of POSE. And I will pass it on now to Lucas. Hey everyone, welcome. I've uh, been meeting you online uh, through reading your comments and chatting. Uh, I'm Lucas Wright. I'm a senior educational consultant at the CTLT. And I've been interested and in working around open for the past few years now. I've been, I did most of my facilitation for this unit around open app, and I'll pass it to Rian. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rian Number, uh, Education Resource Server from Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology at uh, UBC. Uh, so, during the post, I helped with uh, facilitating the discussion for the open app model and also work on creative uh, comments module, module. And I really like this uh, post program on like, how everyone is really engaging, and I learned a lot from everyone's discussion. So I'll pass it on to Stephanie. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Savage. I am a scholarly communications and copyright services librarian at UBC Library. Um, I like my colleague, Aaron. I pr primarily helped develop the open access content and help moderate the open access discussion in the Canvas course. Um, <laughs> who should I pass it on to? I, I think I can take it back. Uh, okay. I will just just again acknowledge that this is program is really developed by the UBC Library and the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology. And there were other people who contributed who aren't uh, able to make it today, but particularly from the UBC Research Commons that helped develop the research section. Um, I'm just going to go to the next slide. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge that UBC Vancouver, which is hosting this session, is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam people. And as we're meeting virtually or remotely today, I'd also like to acknowledge that here in the lower BC mainland, uh, we're often on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and other Coast Salish peoples. They may be joining from different areas, and I'd just like to take a moment to appreciate, consider, and give respect to the lands in which we are situated. Excuse me. Um, I really appreciate the land where I am as it provides me with many different opportunities. And when I acknowledge that I'm on the unceded territory of the Musqueam people, uh, it's really rooted in the understanding that I, as a member of UBC, am really privileged to be living and learning um, on a territory that is not my own. Um, I do wanna just mention quickly that one of the highlights uh, of POSE for me this year uh, was having Kayla Larson, the Indigenous Programs um, and Services Librarians at the Weewa Library, uh, do a session on the six arts of Indigenous OER where she talked about some of the tensions between open um, scholarship and Indigenous and traditional ways of knowing. If you weren't able to attend that session, we did record it. Um, I'm just gonna quickly drop the link into the chat. Um, one sec while I just paste it in. And you should be able to access it there. Um, just going on to the next slide. So here's our agenda for today. And we hope through the session uh, that you'll have the opportunity to reflect upon the topics and themes that were covered in the post. And we're gonna do a review of the areas and activities we did across the different units. Um, and we also hope that you have an opportunity, opportunity to discuss um, your thoughts about how you might apply some of the takeaways from POSE to your own practices, as well as some of the considerations and challenges um, that you might have in doing so. And then we'll talk a little bit about how POSE will be wrapping up and have an opportunity to provide some feedback so that we can continually improve um, and think about and reflect and update POSE maybe for uh, the next possible offering. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lucas, um, who will sort of provide a look back at what we've been doing. Wonderful. So just as a way to kind of reflect on the overall program, I wanted to do a real high level overview of kind of looking back at what you all have contributed uh, into the program. 
So first of all, just some general chat. So this is a short program, as you've noticed, we've spent four months in the program. You completed four modules, so one on open ed, one on open research, open access, as well as a general module on open scholarship. It's an integrated program. So this enrollment was a mix between students, faculty, staff, library, faculty. So lots of different folks. And it was really exciting to see all the different types of conversation that happens when you cross different roles like that. There were 255 participants to begin with. And this kind of slowly whittled down um, as we went through. And throughout the program, there was 235 discussion posts. So some really rich posts around the, provo the provocations that were included at the end of each module. And although we didn't always comment on the posts, I think we spent a lot of time reading some of the detailed conversations that happened. And then 203 activities completed as part of the challenge bank. So as part of that challenge bank, we made stuff and the activity bank, we made things. And I think part of um, at least my understanding of open is the importance of using our creative energy and releasing things into the world. So here's a few of the things we made. Will, do you mind moving to the next slide? There you go. So we scraped some data from some PDFs and I've, I've just attributed this to Eric C. Um, so just scraping using a program to scrape data. Secondly, we adopted some images. So this is a modified image. Um, I've attributed at the bottom, but adding a little bit of value to an image. And we analyzed open text with Voyant. So this is Siddhartha and an analysis that we did in the activity bank. And we formatted text with LaTeX. So this is uh, LaTeX formatting that Victoria did. So just on your own, what you may want to do as we end this program, not right now, but after the session is take a look at some of the challenges that other folks did. I think in the application of open education um, and open research and open access, it can be really exciting to experiment and play with these tools. So just as a final way to reflect on the program, I'd like to ask everyone a question and Rather than put you into breakout rooms or create a complex interactive activity, we thought we could just have a conversation around this today. And so for this conversation, please feel free to just unmute yourself. I don't even think we need to do raising hands. Uh, unmute yourself and jump in and let's see how this can go. So at the beginning of POSE, we introduced a definition of open. And many of you would have come with an understanding of open. So as this course has progressed, how or has your perception of open changed? And how do you see this understanding changing your practices in this area? So I'm gonna give you just a minute to think about that question and read it. And then I'll open it up to the group to just jump in and share your thoughts. So I'll let you know when our minute of thinking is done and then we can just begin the conversation. All right. So um, I think that's a short minute. I have two kids, so my time's super variable. Hassam, um, do you want to jump in? Yes, thank you. So I, I had taken uh, courses particularly about uh, open education and language learning. As, as you know, the language textbooks are notoriously very expensive and uh, and educators try to come up with ideas to make this more accessible and equitable to for students, especially. So uh, it was very exciting for me to uh, to join and to see to seek ways, and and I learned a lot in uh, in the program. Uh, but my understanding of uh, open got more and more complicated when we got to the latest later uh, articles that we read, and uh, and I, I started to doubt. 
is it more equitable now or not? And that was that was really challenging and interesting for me. I just wanted to share that. It's it, it was really interesting. So yeah, <laughs> I just wanted to say this. Thanks for sharing that. Is it more equitable? It, it's interesting question. And I love that idea of complication, um, it getting more complex as we move through the program, Michelle. Um, Hesem, you weren't alone in that complication. Um, and I think it's wonderful because anything we we wholeheartedly embrace as good and positive just sounds like a cult to me. <laughs> um, but I really, I, I would say this program almost radicalized me. I think open is a solution to a response to a flawed system that needs to be, you know, taken down to to its base again. So it's basically not the best solution. The best solution is, you know, challenging all of these like capitalist value systems imposed on knowledge and sharing knowledge. And not until we do that, can we truly have equitable openness. And sometimes that open itself is not equitable. Uh, equitable and that the labor is not equitable. And sometimes open is not the way to go for some things. It's not the be all end all and the best solution for some things. But I love that. And also um, open data still scares me. I have to go through that that module one more time because you know um, there's a lot to learn there, but I didn't know what I didn't know at first. So now I'm really absorbing it. So amazing course, really enjoyed it. Wonderful, thank you. And I just wanna read a comment from the chat just to um, from Elizabeth, one thing that really stuck out to me was just how some of the details around open that I typically didn't think about, uh, for example, or e.g. how users engage in the long term, uh, it got, as being discussed now, more complicated than just slap a CC on this. I love it, if that makes sense. Dagmar. Yeah, I can only echo what was said, I think, maybe not adding too much, but really it has changed, you know, like I used... Uh, you know, I was kind of really fascinated by open access, you know, in all areas in research and education and so forth. And we had been working a little bit in UBC and my airport with an open educational resource before. But I really felt how naive my whole thinking about open access was through the course. And I mean, those resources, like in many of the additional resources, I couldn't look because of time and my busy turn. But it will be uh, such an uh, kind of amazing resource to go back also later. And so, yeah, what was said, like, I, I really didn't see the burden on, like, you know, like also different shoulders, which are connected to open access. And I think that's really missing in a lot of academic discourses. So I think it's very important that we are educated in that and that we are knowledgeable about that so we can get the message out why open really matters and is important, but also what needs to be done and what structures need to be changed and yeah, those are some pretty tough structures <laughs> as we dealt with. Um, yeah, and especially for me, I feel um, also the open science aspect was really interesting as well, like to really rethink uh, my field of philology and working with manuscripts. And I mean, we, do, we are doing a lot already there. So that was really nice to see, but that's really something where I feel, oh my God, I really wanna do um, stuff with that more. Yeah, anyway, um, it was really super helpful. And I feel like when I look again at the definition, which I already completely forgot <laughs> because so much time, but it's in the chat there, I still feel that this is a lot, especially when as a social impact and inclusion, I think it pretty much mirrors these challenges that um, Hassam and Michelle has been speaking about because that's kind of still missing, right? That, yeah, everything is, you know, kind of balanced on the different shoulders and, and yeah. I'm kind of very, um, very motivated to work my part in that. Great. Thank you. I like the idea of balanced on different shoulders. Um, just thinking about the application of this. So um, just the second question there. So we've kind of talked a little bit about a shift around your practices, perhaps, or sorry, a shift around your perception of the term open. How do you think this program is going to impact or your knowledge or your learning or what you experimented with this program? How is it going to impact your day-to-day -day practice now? And yeah, I'll just kind of open that to everybody. Well, I know I'm going to um, adapt a lot of your resources um, uh, 
in my own practice as an information um, provider to faculty and students. So much of it was so well presented and I was like, oh, this is a beautiful masterclass of um, at educational design that I can, because it's open, it's not stealing, but I can, I feel like I'm stealing something really, really valuable. So of course there'll be attribution, but it still feels like it's stealing. Um, so that's just one day on a day-to-day -day basis. I think I'll, I'll really use this as kind of um, a touch, a touchstone to come back to and revisit and see how I can incorporate that in, in what we're doing um, on a day-to-day -day basis and how we're communicating to um, our users. Wonderful. Thank you, Erin. Go ahead. Well, I, I know I'm, I'm long uh, farther ahead maybe on some of the open scholarship journey than, than others, of course, as being one of the facilitators of POSE. But reaching back and thinking back to when this was all new, it, it becomes really important to understand how developing a workflow for your practice is extremely important because it's easy to forget because it's not streamlined into processes of publishing um, and processes of sharing. We're used to a very traditional, outdated and old sort of system. Uh, so we have to make those workflows for ourselves and to follow through on those workflows. So I think that's what I took away when I started engaging in this is my need to put it into my practice in a very kind of conscious way rather than thinking at the end when you're like, oh, if I just put a license on it, but I didn't think about all of these other aspects. So think about thinking about that as a, as a way of moving forward. Wonderful, thank you. And just to um, speak to the open resource side really quickly, all of these resources are of course open and we encourage you to steal, borrow, remix, et cetera. And please share back what you do um, as, Someone who's worked in this area a lot, it's so interesting to see how open courses and resources continue to grow and so many other courses and resources just slowly uh, disappear. So I'm excited to see what continuous building on this course can mean. So thank you for sharing. Um, if you have a chance to take a look in the chat, there's a couple of additional comments in there. Um, I hope in this section, we had a chance to kind of broadly reflect on the program. And now what we're going to do is unpack some of the specific units a little bit. All right. Sorry, so I'm going to ask uh, Steph if you would do the open access um, unpacking. Yep, absolutely. Um, so I'll be speaking sort of on behalf of Aaron and myself, who were your open access module creators and discussion moderators. So um, being this early module, we were so pleased to see enthusiastic participation right out of the gate. In particular, the responses to the posted reading um, in the discussion forum got a lot of you thinking very deeply about the complexities of OA. And I think we've sort of heard that here today that um, it is complicated to think about open access. Judging from the, comp uh, the comments posted in the forum, it appears that the article and resulting discussion provided an opportunity to consider the implications of open access, both on an individual and systemic level. So we hope that you will carry that with you that critical understanding of open access with you um you know long after pose is over and it sounds like many of you have already started to think about that responses to the open access activities were also very successful and again we were impressed with the interest and curiosity that participants engage with the different content with just to mention a few that stood out to me i noticed that um, for several people who did the predatory publishing activity it was actually more difficult than they would have suspected to define and to decide if a journal was truly predatory or not. So this is reflective of my own personal experience um, and perhaps explains why authors are so likely to return to that small subset of trusted journals that they've either personally developed a relationship or that are recommended to them or approved by their departments or colleagues. And, and um, I also enjoyed reading the responses to the how much does your reference list cost activity, which invited participants to take an article that they had either recently read or had written and track down the cost to access all of the items on their reference list as if they didn't have any library access to that material. 
So there were 24 responses for, for that activity, this iteration of pose. And the, the totals that people came up with varied widely from you know, a couple hundred dollars to well into the thousands. So the, act, uh, the activity also provided a look in sort of the crazy economics of scholarly publishing that most of us as you know, being affiliated with a university are fortunately not often exposed to. Finally, it was great to see that so many of you decided to do the public domain and traditional knowledge activity. This one had the highest response rate of all the activities in the open access um, unit, and I think really reflected the willingness of participants to engage in some of the more thorny areas of openness. So it was great to see that as well. And I will pass it on to Erin. Thank you, Steph. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the open research uh, part of POSE, uh, which I was lucky enough to, to facilitate also with uh, my colleagues. Um, open research takes time and it can be extremely complicated. I think, in fact, this module is often considered the most complex as the principles and practices are often really new to participants and pose or open research is uh, often discussed within the scientific realm rather than any of the other realms of, of scholarship. So sometimes you can't, uh, sometimes you're unaware of its possibilities. So even the Peel article uh, and the Pose website really have different definitions of what open research means, uh, which in itself can be confusing. But you engaged with the content and the article with a lot of enthusiasm and a really great insight. The Peel article really seemed to resonate with a lot of people. Uh, for Peel, humanities wasn't about uh, data being uh, focused on data in uh, an empirical study sort of sense, uh, but more we were looking at how it connected into humanities when discussing open research. Uh, and the focus is on open workflows rather than that kind of positive sense, positivist, positivist sense of um, uh, the confines of itself to being data, uh, uh, the experience of data, as well as excluding the sort of um, ways of thinking about information that uh, lend itself to different sides of scholarship. So humanities fields are, are telling stories of difference, um, not congruence. Uh, so access and reusability are more important than replicability if you remember those two terms, uh, when we were discussing data. And many of you connected the potential of open research and open data practices with digital humanities work. And you introduced ways that open research practices can better align uh, with the ethics of public trust and knowledge mobilization practices. So there was like a really rich discussion happening uh, there with engagement with that article. So the activities that you engaged in in this module were really interesting. What we tried to do with the activities is we gave you the large sense of open research. So we gave you big platforms like OSF if you wanted to engage, but also uh, gave you opportunities to enact some of the smaller practices around open research. So I enjoyed how many of you were surprised and interested in naming an organization in file conventions, something that I think is really just common practice for many librarians or information professionals. This is the work that we do is organizing information. But you saw the value of why that became important to organize information in certain ways, sharing um, uh, a file that gave information about the files that you were sharing and the value of that, as well as the types of formats and how that actually impacts openness. Uh, finally, your text uh, analysis using Voyant was particularly interesting, as you noted the ways you can unearth a different way to evaluate texts using Voyant, which is uh, a lot of you looked at gender terminology and how it was used in text, which was really fascinating. But you also talked about the potential data skewing that can happen when using texts that have that editorial material attached, which was also uh, really fascinating. It was like a meta analysis of these open tools, which was really uh, great to engage in and is important in openness generally, that kind of analysis of the process of what you're engaging in, not just the text uh, outputs themselves. So um, really great work. Um, hope that that uh, section was, was valuable to you and you learned a lot. And I will now pass it to Rie to talk about open education. Okay, thank you. So I'll be doing the overview of the open education module. 
And we started with an exploration of what makes an educational resource open and taking a deep dive into Creative Commons license and then exploring the five R's, which is the reuse, retain, revise, remix, and redistribute of open content. Then during the open chat with Tyler Larson, we explored the six R's for Indigenous area, which are respect, relationship, reverence, relevance, and reciprocity. Then we touch on open formats and accessibility, and we look at finding and evaluating OER, the benefits of using it, modifying or adapting it in order to help provide meaningful contextualized learning materials, as well as digging into the workflows for creating and sharing open resources. And open education is not just access to knowledge, but also equitable participation in the creation of knowledge. With the idea that knowledge creation is a social practice, we explore different definitions of open pedagogy and look at what it means for students to be knowledge creators and examine both the opportunity, but also the risk, privacy issues and challenges that are involved when working in the open. In the open education discussion, there were a lot of interesting discussion about Sava's blog post. Many discuss OER takes a lot of skills, time, costs, resources, and effort. And because of that, bigger institutes with power have great advantage, which may reinforce power imbalances. And some discuss creation of OER may actually help solve power imbalance by sharing the expertise and making the materials reusable. And some discuss about importance of incentivizing OER, such as by making the tenure promotion requirement or providing support for creating OER. And there are also great engagement around activity banks. Uh, some have shared experience about the Wikipedia article that they have contributed and saw the articles going over years. And some shared about the adaptation of textbooks to another language and MOOCs and OERs in non-English speaking countries or the translation of an open textbook into uh, Japanese. And that's all for the open education uh, overview. Awesome. So as you can hear, we covered a lot of different topics and themes and, and uh, I'm just going to skip to the next slide if I can. So we're going to um, do a little bit of a more intimate um, and in-depth discussion about open scholarship and how some of the topics and themes that we discussed uh, throughout the pose um, could maybe be applied to, to your own practice. Um, and I do just want to say up front um, in my own experience that I can find breakout rooms sometimes to be um, awkward or, or even stressful for myself. I know other people feel that way, but I we really do hope that you take this opportunity to sincerely engage um, with your colleagues and fellow participants in the program and discuss um, some of the key takeaways that you have with the program. Um, as, as we put you into small groups, we do have people from different units and different institutions. Um, please do take a moment just to introduce yourself, maybe just let people know where you're from and, and maybe what you do in your unit or institution. Um, so with that, we're going to put you, it, people into groups of around four, um, and we're going to ask you to address these sort of three bullet points. Um, so what have been the key takeaways or learnings that you've, you've learned in the program? Um, what are the actions? Um, so what open scholarship actions are you taking or will you be taking um, that uh, can apply to your own work? And then finally, what are the challenges or considerations? And we know there's a lot for applying some of the open scholarship practices uh, in different contexts. So we'd love to, to hear more about your thoughts on that. And as part of this, we're gonna be asking um, you to sort of capture some of the discussion. So maybe as part of your group, you can, can designate a scribe or you can, can all contribute, but we do have a Padlet um, and you should be used to Padlets by now. Uh, these are the what we've been using for the unit reflections. Here's the direct link to the Padlet. And this is just a place to capture some of those takeaways, actions, and challenges. Um, so we're going to go into breakout rooms for about 15 minutes. Uh, we will have us uh, facilitators coming into the breakout rooms as well to help uh, with discussions. And then we'll come back and debrief as a larger group. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and let Lucas um, put us into breakout rooms. North American kind of notions of, of openness, of copyright, of open access and all that, that we gave it a larger context about recognizing some of the privileges that we have <laughs> by being, you know, in Canada, at UBC. So we had those larger discussions and streams that kind of happened inside of the the pose content. And, and as some people reflected on that being valuable, which was nice to hear. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll know the group I joined also talked a little bit about the, the idea of open, um, having different contexts in different countries and, and Europe having um, sort of different backgrounds and, and uh, but hitting upon some of the higher themes and open as well. Michelle. Um, 
we have, we in our group had a few different backgrounds. Um, a few of us were new, relatively new to open scholarship and, and pedagogy. And I think it was the feeling of we didn't realize how naive we were about open until we got really, really in depth. And that was a feeling I really had is like, oh, I, I look back on some of the things I said about open before and I was like, oh, that was really naive. Um, it's so much more complicated than that. And um, someone was commenting how many decisions at every step in the workflow come into play that you have to consider when you undertake open. It's just not something you can really do off the side of your desk and yet so many people expect it. Furthermore, there was some, some comments about even one, one thing is how much the technology to support open has changed and evolved. Someone was commenting that in 2013, when they were looking at open, there just wasn't a lot of options there um, that, the, that they could use to make quality work. And that's really, really changed as well and really improved. Uh, thanks for that. And I think um, maybe speaking on, on behalf of the facilitators a little bit, one of the reasons we really wanted to do a, a longer program was to be able to get sort of beyond that intro level um, and into some of the, the more complexities that can be in open. And it, you know, hearing the comments in both in the small groups and the earlier discussion are really great to hear that, that we kind of hit upon that. Uh, any challenges that, that people talked about in applying maybe open to your own practice? Maybe if you don't mind, I can call on, on somebody from the group I joined, but em Emily, do you wanna talk a little bit about the, the open access um, challenges you're facing is in uh, terms of costs for APCs and, and things like that, or, or Karen? So as, I was, uh, as our group was discussing, we had a couple of researchers and I'm with the CRKN, which is the National Academic Consortium uh, in Canada. And one of the things that is a bit of a challenge is that when it comes time to um, negotiate agreements, that's always coming out of the library budget. And when, um, if it's not coming out of the library budget for, for transformative agreements, if you're paying directly, then it's coming out of the author's pocket. There is no real kind of centralized APC funding opportunity in Canada. And so that's causing some issues when, when it comes to, to kind of a cohesive approach, because there is no um, easy solution that everyone can apply. And then the big problem as well is when you think about things like the tri-agency funding that some researchers may get, there are open access mandates there, um, but the funding that a researcher will get is kind of just a, a bucket of funding, or it may be specifically earmarked for per research purposes. And in order to take advantage of the research funding and yet meet the open access mandate that comes attached to it, you're now having to dig into your own pocket for open access funds. So those are kind of some of the, sorry, Will, I was not quite prepared to put that into a coherent sentence all at once. Um, but that's kind of some of the, the things that we're, we're thinking about um, in, in, in the Canadian context is it's happening beyond the library because it's researchers that are doing the publishing, it's researchers that are doing the, the authoring. Um, but then you've got this government policy that comes into play and that is to a certain extent regulated or not um, at different levels. And so, yeah, that's broadly speaking. Um, but I see Erin's got her hand up, so I will very happily pass it back over to her. I just had, um, it's wonderful that you talked about that because I have a, a very local example that just like finally came to a conclusion yesterday about a faculty member who had a tri-agency um, grant that requires open access to be open access in 12 months but the publisher requires a 24 month embargo so there's like the publishers are creating a system where we can't actually meet the standards that are being in place by the tri-agency the requirement of that 12 months and even in trying to negotiate that with them the negotiation is there is no negotiation you're going to publish it within 24 months it's it um, and because they're the bigger publishers like Elsevier the, the faculty members are more than likely just not going to comply until after the 24 month period right so we're setting them up to break the rules of the grant because the publishers aren't negotiating in a way that is, is ethical and meeting those standards. Um, 
more pressure needs to be put on the publishers to actually at least meet the standards that are being put forth by our national associations. But um, who is going to do that? It's not going to be the faculty members. They're either going to pay or not comply, right? So it's tough. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely, you know, and I think one of the themes that came out during POSE is uh, there's a lot of these structural barriers. And, and at some point, there's sort of these large structural barriers, but there's also, um, and sorry, Karen, to put you back on the spot, but small structural barriers too, where, where it's individual people's labor and, and time that goes into that. I know you had a uh, just a recent experience in trying to publish open access as well. Uh, yes, <laughs> perhaps I can also share about that. So uh, for me, like reasons, I, uh, by the way, my background is a first year PhD student uh, at UBC School of Social Work. And recently, uh, my professor and I, we had a publication and we really want to make it like open access, but it's $5,000. And um, as, a, as a student <laughs> researcher with very like with very, very limited funding, research funding. And yeah, my professor just said, ah, Karen, I really hope that it can be open access. But yeah, to be honest, I think you, you, you just need to put this idea aside because you're not going to pay for like that $5,000. So yeah, so so it it happens every day and it, it just, it's just, yeah, so sad. <laughs> it cannot be open access, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Any... Uh, Michelle, I see your, your hand is up. So. I know that in the UK, they had their funding bodies negotiate with the publisher saying, no, we're going to do that. Who would do that in Canada? Who, who would go to bat for us? Because like, I just feel like how nice would it be to have someone more powerful than like us? We're powerful in our own way, but not with like taking on publishers. I'm gonna look at maybe Aaron or Emily to, to respond. If... I mean, I can certainly speak from the um, kind of outside of the university perspective because within the university, uh, your library does an incredible amount of work on your behalf. Um, I will thank, you know, thank your librarian uh, the next time you see them, thank all of them. The, they do an enormous amount of direct work with publishers. And then for some of the kind of bigger publishers, um, and I know Aaron had mentioned, I think it was Springer or Elsevier. Um, so publishers on that kind of scale, there are academic consortia that negotiate with them on behalf of many institutions at once. So CRKN has 76 academic members across the country. UBC is one of them. Um, and we do that kind of advocacy and negotiation um, Thank you so much for those. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. a work in progress. We're very aware that, that there are um, all of these challenges uh, with open access and we're still trying to figure it out ourselves to a certain extent mm -hmm. as well, because there's, there are a number of different open access models, which obviously you, you've, you've been discovering, um, but, and they're not always going to be right in every circumstance. And then the challenge becomes they're not always right for every institution. Yeah. Um, some larger institutions may have more capacity to jump into a particular open access model um, that remains to a certain extent modeled off of what libraries used to pay. Uh, there are other direct to open like subscription mm -hmm. models that a library may have extra end of year funds that they can invest in and small institutions may not. So while the consortium does, and I, I'll say consortia because I know the other consortia in Canada are doing this as well. While we do a lot of work to try and advance open access, we're also very mindful that it has to be an equitable opportunity for mm -hmm. the libraries that are participating. And that does slow it down a little bit while we try and figure out what exactly that's going to look like. Yeah, um, sorry. I didn't want to like undercut how much, like I understand no, no, it's, like, but it's, how much it's work perfect. it is. Yeah. No, it's a perfect I, opportunity I, to put your researcher, yeah. like to put researchers in touch with the fact that at your institution, mm -hmm. the library is that resource. I, I think it's a whole conversation about yeah. whether that's appropriate or not at a different I just, time. I kind of want the, the Canadian government or shirk to go in and just say like, hey, mm -mm, mm -mm, we're giving them this money. So you got to play ball with them. I think that's like that might my be your naive. local. That might be your local MP to take that. Yeah, one this is this is my naive being like, 
Well, and, I think that's possible to like to actually do a national kind of push for open. But the problem is, is with another challenge, which is tenure and promotion practices are still warranting that if I publish in nature, I get major points versus if I don't. So if we're saying now at the national level, there must be compliancy, um, but still at our local institutional level that you still have to publish in these major journals, then that those two things aren't meeting up. And I think we saw some of that backlash happening in the UK, where there were authors that signed a document saying that, you know what, I'm going to publish in these large journals because I need I need to, this is where my community is, et cetera. So I think that um, it's it's an entire system. It's not just the one system, just make put pressure on the publishers, but also there has to be pressure on institutions to think about tenure and promotion practices a little differently. Awesome. And, and uh, maybe just to, to slightly sh shift the conversation to um, from open access to open research, I just wanted to to see if anybody had any. So we, we talked a lot about sort of the structural challenges that persist. Um, one of the the things I took away from the the program this year, particularly um, as somebody who's not engaged in open research, and going back to a bit what Aaron talked about was the idea of developing workflows, but also I would say really documenting and sharing and and publishing those workflows openly. I think could be really a powerful uh, way of informing an open practice. But my my challenge is time and and the labor that it takes. So it's much easier to to do my workflow than it is to publish and get it into a format that I, I'm willing to share. I was wondering if anybody else had sort of personal challenges in, in taking up some of the, the um, open work. Dagmar, I see, see your hands up. Is that? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, yeah, I, I'm thinking a lot about things, but I'm still kind of in the process. So I feel like the, all, the whole open research flow, open science, and um, also certain things of vulnerability of getting data out, but then also having my own more transparent workflows. I wouldn't say that I'm totally chaotic or whatever, but there's definitely kind of potential to reorganize and um, get things in that are beneficial for me, but also for yeah, for the public, so to speak. So, so I feel like I have to kind of reorganize myself and having gotten this tool, it's also like it's more time, as you say. It's, it's, it's such, and who is kind of like, I have to think about a clever way how I'm also kind of um, rewarded for doing that in a certain way. And that brings back the open research, um, open uh, research publication format that it's not just the journal articles and so forth, but that there's appreciation of certain things and how to do that clever in the structure I'm in. So I think, yeah, there's really complicated uh, reflection process which was started through um, through the session so it's not kind of a real answer but like the same it's, it's a lot of more it's, it's more time but then the question also um, it can also help me maybe for future research project because I can so that's all the things of retaining data and so forth so I feel there's a lot of like benefits of investing this time personally so but I want to try to find a way that you know it's balanced in a way and not just too much time but not enough personal benefit for me yeah so that was that's a really interesting process which started through reading about that so that was very helpful for me personally right yeah and i, I like that articulate articulation of, of the balance thanks thank you for sharing that anybody else want to share something that they discussed in the groups or or some thoughts that maybe these discussions have have brought up to if it's okay to end on um it is a lot of work. It's a lot of time. We know there's value in it. I think we we have a feeling about that. But maybe when thinking about engaging in open scholarship is don't think about it as a whole. Think about it in parts, which is what small modification can I do now to my already existing workflows that lends itself more to open? And then once that just becomes a part of your practice, add something new. We often talk about open as a, a continuum. You can do something very tiny. You can go all the way. Um, but if you're new to it, going all the way seems so daunting. But noticing one small item, saying that, yes, putting Creative Commons license, ensuring that I, I have that on my content so that people can just use it, that is at least a start. Um, so I think, think that way, think about small steps and then just slowly keep adding them. And then suddenly five years down the road, you're like, oh, I'm doing a lot of 
open. I just didn't think I was um, until you take that step back. Awesome. Thank you for that, that comment. It's really true. And when I work with instructors who are doing open ed stuff for the first time, I always try to say it's iterative. You don't have to do it all in the first go. Like, um, and things can always be improved. So um, with that, I'm going to share my screen again and, and turn it over to, to Lucas um, to talk about uh, maybe getting some feedback for how we can improve the program. Wonderful. Thanks, Will. And so if you can, yeah. So um, as part of POSE, this is our second iteration of it. And each iteration, because this program is really for you and for who takes the program, um, we really want to get some feedback so that we can make changes to the program. Um, we can amplify parts of the program that you like. So we've created a short feedback survey, and rather than sending it home with you, we'd like to give you a few minutes to take it now. And part of that is just so we can get some uptake. Generally, what we find is when we send out surveys, we get much lower uptake. So we have a survey. It's going to take you between two to six minutes. So I'll give you about, let me time out six minutes now. I'll let you open the survey. I think Rhea shared it in the chat there. It's a completely anonymous survey and we will use it to refine and uh, redesign the post program. So please go ahead now. I'll time you for six minutes and then afterwards we're gonna wrap up the session. All right, so thanks for taking the time to do that. Again, please feel free to continue completing it uh, after the session. And I am going to turn it over to our facilitation team to wrap it up. Okay, yeah. So I will be just kind of closing up with some last minutes, um, like administrivia, I guess. Uh, so the course uh, cohort closes on uh, May 15th. Uh, and we have had people uh, contacting us for uh, possible extensions. I just wanted to mention that we are hoping to make sure that we have the certificates of completion uh, sent in early June. So there is a bit of a, a time uh, requirement for us there. Uh, if you feel like you could, um, if you do need uh, some sort of extension, you can contact us and we can see if it, it works within our timelines. So the CTLT events team is going to generate a PDF certificate of completion, and that's going to be sent to all of those who have completed their work through an email, again, sent in early, early June. And in terms of the actual course content, the course content is openly licensed, which means that anybody can reuse it, uh, go back to it, mod uh, modify it for their own purposes. Uh, it has that CC BY 4.0 license that we all know what that means now. Um, and uh, we've also created a page on the POSE website under resources where you can download the, download the course content in an XML format, should you want to um, use that format. Um, I believe the link that we currently have there might be to the old content. So we'll, we'll have to regenerate that XML format, but it'll be made available to you. Um, so feel free to use the content, reuse it however you choose. And even if you want to let us know how it's being used, we're just, I'm just curious. It's, it's exciting to see when your content gets reused. So do feel free to, to reach out to us. And I believe that is the end of our session today. But if you have any questions that you would like to ask, now's, now's your time. So not seeing any questions questions, but it just, again, really wanted to thank everybody who participated in POSE, the discussions, the activities, all that was amazing. Um, and it, was, it made it a lot of fun for, for us on the facilitation team. So really appreciate um, everything that you've done. Yes, thank you everybody for participating. This was really, really enjoyable uh, to read all your ideas and comments. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone. It was great to get to meet all of you. <laughs>